Fred Gwynn is Judd Crandall. I remember thinking the guy from The Monsters, but then he was absolutely fantastic in Pet Cemetery. You didn't have any scenes with him, but give us your take on Gwynn's performance in that film. Oh, well, he kind of holds the, the whole film together, you know. He's the, his performance, I think, is the spine of the whole film. He's so... Um, he's Well, he just holds... He tells the whole story, and his performance is... is you know, it's not that typical over-the-top um, horror film uh, performance. There's an awful lot of subtlety to it, and uh, the guy sure knew how to handle this material. So I think he holds the whole film together. He's the thing that, he's the spine of the film. For as memorable as Pet Cemetery is, Gwyn, Church, Gage, it's your character, Victor Pascal, that comes to most people's mind when discussion turns to the Stephen King classic. On a different scale, of course, it reminds me of Anthony Hopkins' Hannibal Lecter from Silence of the Lambs. Very little screen time, but simply indelible. After all these years, what do you think it is about Pascal that stays with people? I, you know what? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. I mean, it's kind of a unique character um, for any kind of film, uh, but even in the, the horror genre, you know, because he's, I mean, he looks all bloody and uh, scary, but he's really a guardian angel trying to help everybody, you know? Mm. He's, a, he's a benevolent force rather than um, a force of, of evil, uh, which is what he looks like, you know? Mm -hmm. So maybe that has something to do with it. I don't know. Or maybe it is the, um, you know, the fact that that role provides a lighter touch to all of the darkness uh, that's unfolding in the film. Maybe that's it. But uh, quite frankly, I'm stumped. <laughs> <laughs> So what has Pet Cemetery meant to your career, and does a day go by where you're not recognized for it? Um, well, uh, it's, it's very odd, you know, because at the time when we shot it, I mean, the, um, the, the book was very, very popular at the time, certainly. Mm -hmm. uh, but it took a long time to get this movie shot. From what I understand, it was because Stephen King insisted on two things, that it would be shot in Maine, and that uh, his own screenplay would be used for it. And uh, I guess this took years to reconcile. Um, so then when it came around, um, you know, it was a low-budget horror movie. Um, certainly it was a Stephen King film, so it had some cachet, but not the... Uh, Stephen King was, you know, not as revered uh, uh, artistically as he is today. Back then, he was a, a very popular horror horror book writer, mm -hmm. um, but it, it wasn't that anyone recognized any artistry, which by now, of course, everybody does. Right. Um, so it was kind of a, a film like uh, in the middle there, between that you know a, a pulp horror guy and a um, and a, a real uh, good writer. Um, so so at the time, it was it was a low budget horror film, and uh, it was just another job that all of us did. And who would have known that it would <laughs> uh, last so long? I mean, that's kind of a, it's kind of a, um, a, a quirk of fate. You never know what, as an actor, you never know what of your work is going to survive and what's going to be forgotten, you know? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and this one, for some reason, is hugely popular uh, now. Um, and who knows why? I don't know why, but uh, it's great. It's terrific that it's so popular. <laughs> <laughs> now, yes, people still recognize me from the movie, and I, that also just completely shocks me because um, I did have a bit of makeup on, you know? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> now, you've done countless interviews pertaining to Pet Cemetery, but there has to be a behind the scenes story you haven't told, something cool, creepy, or funny. Can you give us a nugget on Pet Cemetery no one's heard before? Oh, something no one has heard before. Oh, my. Um, yeah, I've kind of told all these <laughs> the good stories, you know. Um, uh, let's see. Well, there were, there were a lot of scenes, a lot of um, scenes of mine that were cut out. Um, mm -hmm. One was, uh, I was, I was, there are pictures of this, but the, it was not put in the final uh, film when um, 
Dale and Fred were, were on their way to the Micmac burial ground from the pet cemetery, and they climbed through all those rambles and everything. Uh, there, were, there was a shot of me um, uh, floating in a tree um, that was never used. And that was, you know, that required all sorts of rigging and uh, mm-hmm. all of that to, to have me hanging there without standing on a branch or anything like that. And I think I had some lines there, too. Um, and that was, you know, that, that was one of those shots where um, it took, you know, five hours to get into makeup. Yeah. Um, uh, and then to get into the rigging and everything up in that tree took uh, maybe another two hours. Uh, and then the shot itself took like 10 minutes, 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and then they had to get me down, and then it took another two hours <laughs> to get out of the makeup. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of that's kind of how the shoot was for me, mm-hmm. and, and because of the nature of the shoot, a lot of my shots were kind of alone. You know, mm-hmm. um, often you know when I was like warning everyone, don't go on, don't go on. Often the the the, um, uh, the characters I was speaking to had already been released, and so I was speaking to a script supervisor or or a stand-in just standing there. You know, so. Mm-hmm. So through, for a lot of the film, I didn't act with the rest of the cast. I kind of <laughs> had my own little one-person film going on. <laughs> uh, that's a story that I don't think I've ever told, because uh, I always forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad I could remind you. <laughs> yeah. Um. There were also shots, I, I've mentioned this somewhere, I don't remember where, but we did these shots of, um, of uh, me flying as well in a studio. There were there were shots. Uh, the the idea was when I'm leading um, Dale down the path into the pet cemetery on that first night, that uh, I start running and then I take off and I fly into the woods. Oh really? My arms, the whole shebang, you know. Um, and so we did this in the studio uh, months after the principal photography had finished. Um, and it was all green screen, uh, or it was blue screen at the time, I guess. Um, and uh, so it was all rigged up, and I would have to jump off this platform, and these, the, the, the rigging would pull my feet up, and I would flap my arms, and the camera would zoom past me so that it looked like I was flying. Mm-hmm. Like how they do with those, those Star Trek things and Star Wars things. It, the, that thing is still, and the camera zooms past um, but uh, they never used it, and I was so disappointed. I thought, what a great idea. But uh, in talking with uh, Mary Lambert, I don't know, a couple of years ago, she said, yeah, it just it didn't, it didn't look good with the technology at the time. She said it just looked a little cheesy. Mm. And, so, um, and so they stuck with what we had shot on the set, which was great because, you know, she was very, um, she really just had her eye on the quality of the film rather than gags. You, you know what I mean? Right. Uh, the film looks beautiful, and it's that artist's eye that she has. But also, you know, one of those uh, things that nobody notices is that she would <clears throat> she would um, prefer something that was done well to something that was done okay but had this gimmicky feel to it. You, you mm-hmm. know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And maybe that's one of the reasons that the film is so popular still, because it's a really solidly made film mm-hmm. from the director's perspective, you know? The definitive scene of the picture for me uh, is Gage's death. I mean, it's not drawn out, but it's long enough to just rip viewers apart knowing what's coming. The screams from Denise Crosby's rage, the look of desperation on Dale Midkiff's face running toward the street. Horror has many memorable scenes, often gory and glamorous kills with the call of the day, but for as little as shown there, that scene is excruciating to watch even now, isn't it? Oh, yeah, 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 um, uh, yeah, Dale was fantastic. He would, like, I learned a lot from him working on that film, uh, actually, because he had more uh, film experience than I had back then. Mm -hmm. uh, And uh, I learned a lot working from him, and one of those things was just his pure commitment to those, those moments where if you don't commit to it as an actor, uh, it can come off as really cheesy and uh, melodramatic. But because of his commitment, it really just uh, it just sends shivers down your spine, you know, mm-hmm. and it really packs an emotional punch. Mm-hmm. 
Now you touched on a little earlier about the makeup process and whatnot, but it sounds as though you ended up lunching solo quite a bit on the set for Pet Cemetery. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> yes, he <laughs> did because when I had that makeup on, I, I you know, I, I always like to to have lunch with the, the cast and crew, you know. Um, but on that one, whenever I would sit down at the lunch tables, whoever was to my left side would get up and leave <laughs> to say, I'm sorry, I can't eat my spaghetti looking <laughs> like that. <laughs> and, and I felt so bad because it would happen. It didn't happen just once. It would happen every time I would go in and sit down to eat. Uh, whoever was on that brain side of me would get up and leave. Yeah. So I ended up going to my trailer and having lunch in there because I didn't want to disturb anyone. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Now, rumors have swirled here that we could be in for a Pet Cemetery remake in the next year or two. I mean, to begin, where do you fall on reimaginings of classics? Would you be interested in seeing another team's vision of Stephen King's Dark Tale? And do you think there's potential for improving upon what we already have? Um, well, uh, yes, these, these rumors have been swirling for years now about uh, remaking Pet Cemetery, and a lot of people, I guess, have tried and uh, hasn't gotten off the ground. But I don't know, it sounds like... Um, Maybe it's going to get off the ground now, but uh, we all said that five years ago and ten mm -hmm. years ago. So we'll see. Uh, for myself, I think it would be pretty interesting, actually, um, to have uh, a new take on the same material. Um, uh, I'm not opposed to it at all. I know a lot of the fans are opposed to it, but uh, I think it could be quite interesting, you know, um, to see an, another group of filmmakers and actors and designers um, uh, put put this up on the screen again. But, you know, it could be that, like many of these remakes, that the it's a film of its own time, you know. Mm -hmm. it's definitely an 80s horror film. Mm -hmm. um, and who knows if it would work uh, as a, you know, as a horror film now. The horror genre has changed quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, and making Pet Cemetery, which, which at the time was kind of cutting edge with the stuff that it dealt with, mm -hmm. but now it's kind of benign, you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I don't know. I, I think it'd be interesting. I'd love to see that, you know, mm -hmm. myself. I, th I think, uh, great, why not? Now, a documentary is in the works for 2016, of which I'm sure you've been a part. From your participation with that endeavor, what can fans of Pet Cemetery expect from Unearthed and Untold? Oh, that's that's a fantastic documentary. Um, yeah, I helped I helped the guys uh, quite a bit with that out here in L.A. Uh, with uh, getting some interviews and things. It, it's terrific. Um, it's really, really, really interesting because uh, uh, they found everybody. They found <laughs> they made several trips up to Maine and found all these people who worked on the film. They found. Um, uh, managed to find some video footage from people who were in the crowd watching scenes being rehearsed and shot. Um, so kind of a, a home movie found footage sort of stuff. It's intercut in there. Interviews with all sorts of people, all of the major players and, and many of the minor players as well. Um, uh, it's a fantastic documentary for anybody who likes Pet Cemetery. It's, uh, it's just full of, uh, of, of um, anecdotes and tidbits about the film that nobody else knows. It's great. It's really, really great. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Now, <clears throat> it's my favorite question to ask because the responses are just amazing, typically. <laughs> but be it at a convention or random encounter, what is the strangest request you've ever received from a fan? Oh, the strangest request. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> well, uh, I guess to to autograph certain body parts uh, <laughs> that shouldn't be autographed. <laughs> that's, that's kind of a funny thing. Also, what's kind of odd is uh, a lot of people uh, seem to have my face tattooed on their bodies. Oh, really? you know, on their calf or on their thigh or who knows where else. That's always a little strange <laughs> uh, to, you know, go to a convention and someone throws their thigh up onto your table and says, look, there you are. And you're like, oh, look at that. There I am on some, some stranger's <laughs> leg. <laughs> but it's, it's, you know, 
none of it is offending. It's all just kind of uh, endearing because mm-hmm. these fans, they're so sweet, and they, they really have a, a, such a, an affection for the film. Uh, so it's all, it's all in good fun. <laughs> I have to ask about that. I had uh, interviewed Sid Haig uh, probably about a year ago, a little bit more than that, and he had talked about that just because of his character from... Uh, you know, House of a Thousand Corpses of the Devil's Rejects, that people want him to sign butts quite a bit. And he said that's something he could never wrap his head around. So I, I, you saying that people ask you to sign body parts, what is your reaction when you hear that or the first time you ever heard that? I mean, that that's not a normal thing for someone to ask. I mean, what goes through your mind when someone asks you that? Uh, the first time I, I was a woman, and I, I just didn't think she was serious, you know. Um, <laughs> she wanted me to sign her breast, and she was wearing this dress so that, you know, you could do it. And uh, and I thought she was joking. I really thought she was joking, and she was absolutely serious. So I did. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, finally, what projects do you have in the works now? What can we see Brad Greenquest in next? Uh, well, let's see. I'm just hunting down the next job right now. I just did a thing that aired, I guess, last week on The Leftover, um, a guest star on The Leftovers. And uh, and I'm trying to, uh, my big problem right now is I'm trying to, um, my next big thing that I'm trying to do is I wrote a, uh, a screenplay that I want to direct. I don't want to be in it, but I want to direct it. And it's a comedy about ghosts. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> Ghost Light, and it's about uh, theater ghosts, and um, and it's a comedy. So I'm trying to get some money together so that I can shoot that here in Los Angeles. That's that's my next big thing. So maybe you'll see my name uh, on the screen as a director uh, one of these years. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, I mean, good luck with that project, and I appreciate you taking a few minutes to talk with me here today. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you. Sure, Landon. Thank you. Thanks a whole lot.